T-E-R-A, it's Toxic Exposure Risk Activity. I want to be very clear here. Terra is over here. Pact Act <laughs> is over here. They have That's pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> they have nothing to do with each other outside of legislation. Okay. Terra is not presumptive at all. It's most closely aligned to secondary. So just like your evidence would shift for secondary cause or stemming from that service connected disability, that's what Terra is. Your evidence shifts to, hey, I have a you know rhinitis due to asbestos exposure because I was on a naval ship and we're over here scraping whatever Navy people do. I don't know. I was a Marine, right? But it's the same basis as secondary, where the exposure, um, your evidence leads to exposure. And I'll say this specifically, a lack of evidence from terror claims is super common, and I don't really understand why. So I'm going to explain what I would do if I was su submitting a disability claim where the connection was based on Terra. What I would do first and foremost is have a current diagnosis, right? If it's hypertension, if it's rhinitis, if it's sleep apnea, sleep apnea can be uh, connected via Terra. If it's migraines via Terra, whatever the connection is, I don't care. You need a clinical current chronic diagnosis. That's a bunch of C's, all right? Um, diagno no diagnosis, no claim. The second thing I would do, this is, this is most important, is... Not just say I was exposed to asbestos. I want I want to know. I want the VA to know my level of exposure. Someone who was 500 meters away who slept in the fob and there was a burn pit on the fob does not have the same level of exposure as the right. dude stirring human feces, right. you know, day in day out because they're a private or they're a lance corporal, right. or maybe they got in trouble and they're on extra punitive duty. So now they're just over here stirring. They got they got JP8. They're literally lighting the burn pit. Okay, I was that person. I didn't get in trouble, um, but in my private days, I had to do some grunt work as a grunt. Um, that level of exposure for six months is much different than someone sleeping a hundred meters away, right? And so the VA doesn't know that. The VA is not; they're not looking at. Oh, this guy stirred poop, right? Because it's not in your records. And so a statement detailing, really detailing your level of exposure is only going to support your Terra claim. And I see that missing all the time. You know, veterans evidence was, oh, I was exposed to asbestos. It's like, okay, and so was everyone else, right? Um, what is your exposure? Did you eat it? Right. Did you breathe it in? Were you sitting right next to it for six months or were you sitting right next to it for one day? Because that that matters when it comes to at least as likely as not connected via Terra. Um, that's what Terra is. It still requires a medical opinion, but the opinion is not direct to service It's via Terra. What's different about Terra and secondaries is your service treatment records, your personnel records, all the evidence from service do play a part in detailing your exposure whereas secondary service connection your service treatment records mean diddly squat because it's not direct it's not connected to service right so terror is not presumptive at all it requires a medical opinion and veterans absolutely need to show a detailed record of that exposure take it away yeah you know and and i'm glad you brought that up clay because i think that with terra you you don't think just because you have something that's that's under that umbrella that it's an easy claim mm -hmm. treat it exactly the same as a direct service connection claim as far as evidence is concerned i was here here's my diagnosis here's all my proof that i was exposed to this which now caused this and work with your doctor to kind of create that it's kind of this weird morphe thing like you had mentioned where it's kind of feels like a secondary uh yeah. kind of a claim but it's a direct service connection but there's this yeah. weird yeah. tying it to the the exposure piece because exposure is something that could create a condition years down the road right mm -hmm. so it's that's why it's different than a direct most direct service connections in which you would say hey this started in my time in service where it's like well it didn't start in my time in service right 
it, it happened 20 years later, but it's because of the Terra umbrella, my exposure to X, right? So a great example would be like the K2 people with the uranium, right? So sure, it's not, not, not a presumptive, but uranium, high exposures cause these things. I have one of these things. And now you're tying all that together and having your doctor write you the letter that just doubles down on the fact that because of that, I have this and that all kind of moves forward. So moving over to presumptives, which I love, I love yeah. presumptives because, and, and obviously look, I mean, it's, this isn't a, I don't want to go down the road of, you know, we need more, right? We do. I get it. Right. There's other conditions out there that should be, there's other locations like K2 that should have a presumptive list. It's not what this is about. So I'm just going to talk about the good things about the fact that there's presumptives. Presumptive conditions are great because why? Because they eliminate the need for a nexus. You do not need to prove that your condition was caused due to your time in service at all. Automatically, the VA, due to your placement in service, right, your location, where you served, except for there's even some caveats to that, which we'll dive into. But for the most part, the presumptive lists are based on areas of service, right? Most common, you're going to see Vietnam and you're going to see Gulf War stuff, right? Those are the two big ones. And if you served in one of these specified areas, locations during a specified time frame, the VA just automatically presumes that if you have any one of these conditions, they have a list of presumptive conditions for different areas, that they just presume that you have that because of your time and service for whatever the factors are. Could be burn pits, could be Agent Orange. And that is great because now all you need to provide for proof is, here's my time and service, here's my proof I served in that location during that time frame. And here's my diagnosis of that condition that's on that presumptive list. And that's it. Now, the one thing I will say, Clay, that sometimes veterans may, may or may not have an issue with is the severity aspect. In some cases, it just it is what it is, right? There's usually a lot of cancers on the presumptive list. So the cancers are what they are, right? Your severity is it's active cancer. Uh, but there's other things where maybe you need to have a bit more of a conversation with your doctor to really detail your signs and symptoms and durations and be honest with that so you can make sure, again, that you're getting that appropriate rating through the schedule of ratings, right? It's not a hidden thing. You can find it, ECFR, uh, Code of Federal Regulations. You can find uh, that or on attorneys' websites. They'll have them listed too. Um, so rating schedule, your condition find it, have the conversation with your doctor, make sure that you're getting all that information in there. The one thing I do want to throw out too, when it comes to presumptives is there are some others. There's a presumptive list for every single veteran, regardless of where you ever served. doesn't matter. Just the fact that you're a veteran and you served and you got out. Mm -hmm. and that's the one year presumptives, right? So if you have your time in service, and um, you got out and let's say that six months, seven months, eight months later, 10 months later, you go to the doctor for X. If it's not an injury, but more of like a disease, you know, I got arthritis or I got uh, migraines or, or um, hypertension or whatever. If it's within that one year, you have a pretty good chance of getting that approved. So hopefully you got documented uh, evidence within one year after service, you could utilize that and file a claim with the evidence that you have. You don't need to prove a nexus um, because obviously you didn't do anything while you were in, so you got out. Now, um, work with an accredited rep on that. There's also uh, several other presumptives out there as well um, re regarding like uh, ALS um, and, uh, whew, boy, I can't remember them off the top of my head. There's like, four other ones that are within three years, seven years, and then lifetime, yeah. uh, which are, which are great. So a lot of people don't know that these things even exist. Uh, so it's important that you, that you do know. And, um, if, uh, I I'll pull it up if you, 
want to talk for a minute. I'll pull up those other ones. Um, so just back over to you for a minute. Yeah, presumptives completely take out the big three. The big three means absolutely nothing when it comes to presumptive conditions. Um, you only need two things, right? A current diagnosis. This is where anytime I have seen a PACT Act claim, which doesn't exist, I'm just using it for it. everyone to understand. Um, anytime I've seen a PACT Act claim denied is due to the veteran not having a diagnosis. So if you were denied and you had a current diagnosis, I challenge you to send us your deci decision letter. You'll see the email on the channel there because um, I've yet to find one. All you need is a current diagnosis and to meet the criteria. So for PACT Act, it's time and location. For tinnitus and hearing loss, it's a one-year time. I think arthritis is in there as well. Then you have your cancers. Um, you have your POW presumptives, your atomic presumptives. There are just all kinds. You have your MUCMIs. Um, there are seriously probably about 150-ish conditions that are right. presumptive, which which is a lot. Migraines can be considered presumptive um, under certain circumstances that comes to undiagnosed illness, and that's a whole other mm. – that's actually difficult to explain. Um, are, are you ready? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm going right, to shoot you guys down. Okay. So, so uh, now there's the one-year presumptives, which I kind of talked about. And again, you know, the idea is go have a conversation. Th this is what I recommend everybody to do. Go, I call it a, a benefit check-in. Contact your local accredited veteran service office, whatever it is. Have a conversation with their whoever answers the phone and ask if you could just set an appointment to meet with an accredited rep to just kind of get a once over. Have a conversation. See if you're missing out on something because there's two things that happen. One, they understand uh, the veteran uh, affairs world and they also understand state benefits in the state that they're in. So yeah. they'll explain to you Dollar. what else is out there and available. Super important to know. And I would also say, bring your spouse, bring your spouse, because it's important for them to understand how DIC works, burial benefits, all that type of stuff are all very important things. Now, when it comes to presumptive conditions, this is, think about this for a minute from a perspective of, it might not be you, it could be a loved one right? Could be a friend, could be a loved one, could be a, a, a grandma, a grandpa, who knows, right? So if there's four other presumptives that are solely based on just the fact you served in the military, that's it. You served, you got out. Hansen's disease. If you got diagnosed within three years after discharged with Hansen's disease, that's a presumptive condition. So just simply, I served in the military, I have Hansen's disease, bam, you get a service connection. Tuberculosis, if that uh, showed up within three years after discharge, service connected. Multiple sclerosis, which is hard for me to say, seven years. If that shows up seven years after your discharge, doesn't matter if you served uh, uh, you know, two years, four years, six years, 25 years, if it showed up within seven years after discharge, service connected. This one is huge, Clay. ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine if you know that your grandfather, for example, had, a, had ALS and served in whatever branch. They did four years, got out, they have ALS. ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease can show up anytime and that veteran is covered 100% uh, by the VA. I, I wondered to myself, Clay, and, and I wondered this the first time that I read this back in the day, was I wonder how many people have served in the military and have ALS and have no clue yep. that this is even a thing, right? And it's just the saddest thing to me to think about that poor veteran out there um, not having any sort of benefits from the VA for ALS specifically, and as a result, their surviving spouse at some point not having anything. And it's it's just a really sad situation. I don't even know what the number is. Maybe it's zero, right? Maybe it is zero and maybe everything's fine. And maybe I'm just getting a little soft as I'm in my 50s now. Uh, but, um, you know, it's just important to know. And I think that, uh, you know, folks, folks need to know it. And uh, I hope that people share it. Back to you. 
Yeah, the um, not to make me sad or anything, but uh, I would kind of add to that statement how many people served who had ALS who already died and their spouse died. Um, right. Oh, yeah. Right. Man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Okay, so back to a uh, not depressing topic. No, that was perfect. That was presumptives. Uh, PAC, PAC DAC is what gets talked about because it's recent. There are so many other presumptives that that the PAC DAC really overshadowed um, that are still there. Okay. 